this whole thing started because last year I gave a presentation in the MDRS track because I've been commander in MDRS. Um, right after my crew was, crew, I was on Euro Moon Mars A as commander, then Euro Moon Mars B had the Yaka Ono, and then the crew that she transferred over was a crew from Peru. And they gave a presentation on, we would love to have an analog settlement for the Anaconda Desert, and they gave all the conditions and so forth. So this got Yako and I excited, so we were like, hey, I wonder if we can design something for this. And this tied into some stuff I've been doing with off-grid homesteading design and so forth for the last few years. And it all gelled into a nice, beautiful package that will be debuting worldwide for everybody's visual pleasure tonight. Um, With um, MDRS, we have a lander analog. We have a really nice base for a 500-day, six-person crew system. But what we don't really have is something that we would consider to be a settlement analog, something to move forward beyond that. So we have, and ironically, one of, the, one of the beauties of MDRS, by the way, is that that diameter was originally based on a Saturn V, which was the best we could do at the time. The Mars Colonial Transport that Elon Musk at SpaceX has been talking about is exactly the same diameter. So we got, we got that one right. Um, but if we break things down into different functions, we can vary the size of the, of the base depending on how much we can afford, how big a crew we need, and so forth. Um, we don't have the multiple outbuildings of the greenhouse over there and, and the tunnels and, and everything. We, don't, we, can, we can put it all together in one unit. Um, we can have a better psychological uh, impact with that. Um, one of the beauties of MDRS is ironically also one of its flaws, which is that we don't have a lot of institutional knowledge going from one crew to the next. The cool thing about that is, is when you step out of that airlock for the first time in your space, you feel like you're landing on a completely unknown world because it's completely unknown to you. Uh, the bad news is that we keep doing the same thing over and over and over again because every new crew feels like the first crew on Mars. So that's great and that's terrible all at once. If we're doing it to a settlement, we kind of want to know what's outside the, outside the door, so to speak. So we want to want to get away from that a little bit. Um, we also tend to record things via the science, you know, the remote science team and so forth but we don't have anything much in-house. It's like, okay, well, here's a book here, and here's that there, and here's a wall map, and you're on your own. I kind of like to get past that, but I would kind of like to get um, that move forward. The other thing is we do a great job of doing the science and simulation at MDRS and the psychology and so forth. It's great for scientific studies, but the engineering is a fixed base because we can't be messing around with that too much. With a settlement habitat, we could probably move to where the engineering of the habitat itself is, becomes an experiment. Um, like I said, there are certain cost advantages. We could, since MDRS had to be a big circular thing, it's a completely different novel fiberglass shell, which was very expensive to fabricate. Um, with something like this, we get things down, broken down into where they can fit into shipping containers, be shipped anywhere in the world set up on site. We can vary the crew size. We can start with maybe just a two-person construction sack, if that's all we can afford. And then we can expand it up to a 10-person base. And then we can expand beyond that. We want to minimize the maintenance costs, uh, because, you know, it's, you know, the smaller your house, the less square footage, the less square footage, the higher quality materials, the higher quality materials, the less upkeep. And if you spread, you know, anybody who's built a house knows, if you, you can either have this much house with lower quality materials or this much house with higher quality materials. If you go this route for more house, it's lower quality materials, so things are, there's more things and they're breaking more often. And that's the state that MDRS is in after 15 years. So what we want to do is start small and keep quality and then move out from there. And then more sponsorship opportunities because this is essentially the ultimate green home. Uh, if you're a university and you're doing an architecture study on greenhouses and, and um, lead studies and so forth and all the other ecologically conscious things and who, what university is not doing that with, has an architecture program, then this is an ideal sponsorship opportunity. Or corporations that make the gear for that sort of thing. There are science advantages as well. Um, I would like to do something with what I call with the data management problem. Um, everything is pretty much done in EVA reports from, from MDRS via email. It's, it's an incredibly 
crude system for the way things work today in, in business and the technology. Uh, we can do better than emails to uh, transfer our data back to the, to the mission support. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is have a central database of three-dimensional geogra geographic model of wherever this thing is, where every time any EVA goes to a particular location, they, they have at their fingertips everything that every other EVA has discovered in that location. That's not good for the discovery factor of being an MDRS. So MDRS still has a role in that psychology. But for a settler mentality, that is perfectly appropriate. Um, we also want indoor data management. We want smart house technology, so now I can stop waving. Uh, we can have smart house tech. Oh, maybe I'm stuck. OK, battery's dead. Um, where we can do, OK, I want to know exactly what the temperature is of my greenhouse at a particular time. And I want to know what it was two weeks ago and what were the weather conditions. I want all that blogged out. Um, I want to know who messed with the thermostat, that sort of thing. I want all that smart house technology that's recently become affordable, integrated into the structure. And the other thing is we have things like LabVIEW that allow you to monitor the equipment in the laboratory. If we had static equipment in the laboratory where we can do contiguous studies across crews, where they're using either the same equipment, or if they bring in new equipment, they're bringing in their own equipment from their own university or their own company or whatever, it plugs into the LabVIEW system and all gets collected in the same central reservoir. So um, I think I'm going to skip ahead and show you what the thing looks like, and then this, this breakdown of parts will make more sense. So let me skip ahead just a bit. Um, and we've got off-grid and analog features and so forth. So we want to be able to do things off-grid, just partly to cut the maintenance cost of bringing in fuel and so forth, but also to increase the fidelity of the design, as I, uh, and also more off-grid experimentation for universities and so forth. Um, from a crew psychology standpoint, I want to get away from this tin can feel of feeling like you're in an airline cabin for, you know, as much as the Mars One people love the idea of living in tin cans for the rest of their lives, most people don't. I think we need to move beyond that very quickly if we want to be able to get into, okay, I want, I want to be able to walk in the garden, I want to be able to look out the observatory, I want to be able to do this, I want to be able to do that, and maybe not have to leave the hat to do it. Um, so I want extensive green space, I want lighting and sound control. Um, Ayako, is, uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, has done a lot with um, studies on lighting and sound and natural sound. And if we make the lights more red in the evening, it tends to relax people. If we make them more blue in the morning, it tends to wake them up, things like that. All that stuff can be integrated seamlessly into the environment. And so as I was designing this thing, I was realizing if I change this just a little bit, this is my dream home. I mean, it's just, there's not that much difference between this and, you know, I just knock the walls out between the state room and have a decent sized bedroom and I've got a dream home and I can, I've also designed this in such a way that everything can be ship, fitted onto a shipping container, or I'm sorry, shipping pallets. Which means that I can build this entire house in my garage if I wanted to. This, the dream house, not the analog. So anybody who owns a house, there's four major components to a house in terms of the expense of the house. If you get a 30-year mortgage, you're spending half that money on interest. The next half of what's left is labor cost. So I've cut the cost of that dream house down to 25% of what it would be if I bought it off the shelf and paid a mortgage on it. If I built it in my own garage in 10 years. No, by the way, I've scaled this so that you could build everything in it in a one-car garage if you had to. So let's get into the design. Um, this is the three-axis view. Um, it's a little hard to see the, the hexagonal structure. This is not quite to scale. This is actually from my other talk where the modules were two meters instead of one and a half meters. But this is the basic idea. Um, so there's the side view, the top view with solar panels, windows, and so forth. You have a greenhouse on one end. It's really hard to see that, so I'm going to go into the next slide. So, on the one end, you have the airlock, the laboratories, then you have basically a little one and a half meter step up, steep staircase. We already have a steep staircase at MDRS, except this one stops about here as opposed to at the next floor. So if you slip and fall, you're not going to break anything if you fall on the steep staircase. And it's not quite as steep as the one at MDRS. Um, so we have storage down there in that mezzanine area. 
is also where the restrooms are, and if you use a composting toilet, if you've ever looked at these things, you need a basement to get that stuff down because gravity wants to go somewhere other than next to you. So consequently, that storage area is also for water waste, uh, waste processing and so forth, and also for water storage over on the clean side. Um, the state rooms are stacked, the greenhouse is stacked, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And then there's another mezzanine on the other side of the kitchen and, and water storage. So looking from the top view, spread out like this, we have, um, and I've changed this a little bit. This is sort of the middle level. I'm going to do something with towers on the ends that move the airlocks out of the, of the hab. So you've got a toilet area, you've got sinks, baths, bath area, storage, showers over here, or we can combine them depending on how we do it. Uh, big, wide area in the middle for a mezzanine, and then gallery kitchen at the top, a gallery kitchen, I'm sorry, and then a nice big greenhouse down the end. So if we slice it in, in sections, um, this is all the, there's science storage and stuff like that because stuff's got to go somewhere. Engineering storage, all your toolkits and whatever, then your gray water filters and so forth. And I'm sorry this is all turned to the side, but if I turn it the other way, you're not going to be able to read anything. Um, next layer, we have the bottom of our greenhouse section with light from the side. Um, next layer is those are two staterooms on one end, two staterooms on the other, and one story above those is the next set of staterooms. You have a total of of eight staterooms there as opposed to six at MDRS. You've got a nice big lab area, a nice big engineering area on that next air edge, and then this is the bottom of the mezzanine. And you'll note that that mezzanine area is sort of the walkway down into the two side greenhouses, and um, there will also be the stairs down into the two bedrooms. In the next layer, you have this nice huge great room essentially with couches and chairs and whatever, and then that Greenhouse is actually on the two ends, they have they are two stories. In the middle it is one tall ceiling. So if you wanted to put bamboo, if you wanted to put a little garden type thing in there with actual trees as opposed to things that are growing no more than three meters high, you can go up the full two stories essentially for anything like that. And then you've got the kid bathrooms, the kitchen and so forth. You actually have more than one bathroom for eight people. Not a bad idea. Um, then on to the top layer, which is another set of greenhouses here, which are in full sun. The one below is in partial sun. It's got a window down one side. So if you wanted to do something where you're limiting the light going in to be more Mars-like, because Mars is the equivalent to Norway in terms of the lighting levels, then you can do something more Mars analog. If at the top you've got full sun, and you can just cut it down or turn it up however you need to do, because you have windows on the top and on the side. Oh, also we have here, if we want to put towers on the ends, we can put a tower, which is the same module, just turned, same module turned this way, and that makes a really nice uh, office, storage area, library, uh, but it also, in this case, makes a nice control tower, if you've got drones, or if you just want to keep tabs on what's going on in the EVA with the side of the hab. Or on the other side, you can slap an observatory down on top of that and never leave the hab to go to the observatory. That's a side view. If it turns out that we have a structural issue with that, with that long thing, we can do a thing with uh, cantilevered uh, cables on, on posts. And then we have expansion options. We can do the hexagonal towers, like I said. We can put a geodesic dome. We can take one of these hexagons, put it on the end, well now we've got a surface this side with a tunnel, or two surfaces going off 60 degree angles to each other. So we have three different expansion options if we want to build onto the head. Um, so if we want to put a geodesic workshop, if we want to put a quad sub hut or something for vehicle repair, if we want to put a second settlement beyond, if we want to put a tunnel along the back so they're not walking through one person's house to get to the next person's house and do the entire thing indoors, we're all set. And then application of the Mars surface. Um, as I said, we originally had the Anacama Desert in mind. That is an extremely low humidity environment. So you actually do need airlocks for, not for controlling oxygen, but for controlling humidity. So the beauty of this idea with the greenhouse on one end is you can transpire a lot of moisture out of that greenhouse and monitor the moisture as it works its way through the hab 
and then as we go back to, you know, so it goes through the great room and everything, and those airlocks are actually functional because instead of sucking all the air out of the room, they're running desiccators 24-7 and refeeding it back into the loop. So the moisture gets sucked out of the airlocks because it's just passively moving through. You are pulling in fresh air along the edge of the, of the uh, greenhouse because, let's be honest, we're not 100% certain what the oxygen levels are going to be in something like this. We want to make sure that we don't suffocate a group because the greenhouse isn't doing its job that day or whatever. But it is still managing the humidity the exact way that you would manage mm -hmm. moisture or manage, well, anything, everything in an enclosed environment. And actually, there's a very similar situation. There is a uh, big, looks like a hotel, and I guess it was used as like a bond villain lair in one of the... In, one of the recent Bond movies, but it's the base where the people who run the outer college observatories work because the humidity is so low at the observatories that they need to go somewhere where they can not get nosebleeds. So they have a big garden in the middle of the thing with pools and so forth, and it's not just there to be decorative and to spend money, it's actually got a function, and it's the exact same function here. It's because you need to manage humidity the way you manage oxygen. Uh, you mind moving that cup? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so as I said, we've got the ability to escape stuff. We've got, if we were going to do this on Mars, um, those hexagonal towers would essentially go to the surface if we were under a shield. We could set another layer of these hexagonal structures above it and fill them with water ice. That would not only give you protection, if, the, if it's reinforced water ice, it's stronger than concrete. So if a meteor hits by, you've got the equivalent of three and a half meters of concrete above you. And then the other thing about that is that if you um, are concerned about cosmic rays, this is also the equivalent to being in the mountains as far as cosmic ray levels in terms of three and a half meters of protection. And if that's not enough, put another layer on top. It's just fine. It's the beauty of modularity. You can always buy more Legos. Um, then we're also doing the whole thing with food growth. We're um, where we're able to supplement the nutrition and so forth of the crew on board and we're getting an analog of that, that environment. Um, so going back to that slide I skipped because we were talking about modularity. Um, so you've got a crew module, a full module, which is a full-size thing, an arch, which is a half module at the base, like where the water storage is. Uh, or I'm sorry, an arch is a, is a, like the mezzanine where you don't have a bottom because it's a walk-through area, it's just sort of a roof thing of the top half. Same thing on the bottom of the base is, the, is a half module because it's for water storage and so forth, you pop up the other modules. And then the towers are the same thing turned on the side. So a minimal cabin outpost I've worked out, I call it a 399 cabin. The reason I call it that is I went to a trailer, or basically a show of, of all these expensive campers and so forth in, in Chicago. And so there's the expensive, like, $100,000 campers and the air streams and all that sort of thing. And then there were these, look like little tiny houses the size of a mobile home, but they were built like half million dollar mansions on the inside. And I was like, what are these things? And why are they all? And I talked to the guy there, and it turns out they're all 399 square feet. Because 400 square feet is considered a house. Yeah. And 399 square feet is considered a mobile home. Mm -hmm. So. Park model. Yeah, so exactly. So That's the cool. idea is basically if it's below that one, you can put it in a mobile home. Two, there's probably property tax issues there because mm -hmm. they don't look at the inside. And then the other thing is, like, it's, it is mobile, it can be put on a truck, it can be moved somewhere else once it's that size. So if we, and the other thing is, the building codes are completely different for something that's considered a camper as opposed to considered a house. So my design for that is basically what if we take hopefully my fingers will hold this properly, something that's basically four modules on the side, and the beauty of this is, because it is a hexagon, the floor space of square footage is considerably smaller than the volume, because you're only measuring this. So if you put four modules like that, you're at about 387 square feet. You can put your waste storage here, you can put your water storage up here, so you've got a gravity feed down to a kitchen bathroom unit on the, on the middle. You can use either the upper or the lower section for a bedroom or an office. You can use this as a mudroom or the experimental garden or whatever. And then you've got basically a nice little micro home for anywhere. And you could probably fit all these sections once they're 
you know, once you put them together on a shipping pallet, you can probably fit it in a 20 foot box truck. What are the dimensions of the modules again? Um, the base modules are six meters long and two, well, this is two meters, but the, this is a 100 scale model, of my previous talk. Um, the, this is one and a half square meters, or one and a half meters, I'm sorry. Because this is almost exactly, if you cut out the middle and fold it in, mm -hmm. you can actually fit it in a shipping container hole. So that's another option, is you just build it, deploy it, and go from there. The sides are one and a half, is what you're telling us? The, the sides are one and a half meters. So if you do the math, it's three, three meters kitty corner, and that's internal. So yeah. external is a little bit Flat surface to flat surface? Uh, this, is, this is six meters. I mean, across. Uh, diagonal? Not, not or height. Models. Yeah, the height. Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head because it's, we'll it's, it's the, <coughs> it's a roughly four and a half meters. I'm sorry. Yeah. So those are your options. You start with a minimum cabin that would get a proof of concept. And if it doesn't mean building code is okay because it's technically a camper, uh, we go for a cabin. Uh, beyond that, if we go to a generation one outpost, we have that many of those modules. Generation one and a half would be um, extended out. Basically, we would generation, hold on, okay. We would just basically cut off the left side of that and just have the middle and the end. So you've got enough cabins for four people uh, or two people on just the bottom. I really should put these in the right order. And then the full outpost is what you've seen. And then the full outpost, <coughs> is the towers would be there. You could add an observatory when Elon Musk decides to donate another one. Yep. Or an observatory tower where you can watch for drones and control them from inside the app, like a quad rotor or whatever, or a rover. Um, and then if we extend the lab up another story the same way we did the other two, then we can have, like, let's say we have a thing where we have, we want to simulate the drone itself being in its own airlock. So we could have a thing where we put it on a you know, sliding tray, we open the outer airlock, slide the drone out from the inner airlock remotely, fly it, fly it back, close, bring it in, close the doors, open the inside doors, and fully simulate the idea of this is a drone airlock. So we get the fidelity psychologically far higher. And uh, the biggest problem I think they would have with this in the long run is it will be really, really hard to get people to leave. Uh, because when you rotate crews, it's very, you kind of have to kick the previous crew out. And we actually had that problem at MDRS with my crew. We couldn't get the previous crew to, to It's like they were just clutching on for your life because they were so happy there. Um, but, you know, in this case, I think it's going to be a bigger problem because it, it is designed to be psychologically, emotionally, everything, a dream house. So any questions? Are you going to write, uh, run a lower uh, PSI compared to uh, earth uh, sea level in these? If it's done it, it's, no. Um, I mean, if you take this to Mars, are you going to run a lower Oh, PSI? if you took it to Mars, would you run it at a lower PSI? Um, yes well, they and do no. Well, they do it in, in travel. Yeah, if you do it in travel, that's one thing. But if you've got the, the, the good slash bad thing about building it under all that ice is you've got all that pressure on the roof that you want to offset. Okay. So you might actually want to take it to sea level. Gotcha. All right. And then the other thing is if the higher if you've got the higher pressure inside and you ever have a leak, you can always um, right. you know, you've got more air to work with before you pass out. Now the other thing that's I'm glad you brought that up because there's actually another advantage to this design. I go out here. Notice the greenhouses are on the end. Greenhouses don't have to be at 14 PSI. They don't have to be at the same PSI as a human because plants don't, most plants don't require the same PSI. They can actually run at, I think, about five, whereas humans require about seven or more. So if you actually had that exposed to the outside, then you'd want a greenhouse and then another airlock, and then your app, because then you've got kind of a half halfway thing, and that lowers the pressure on the air on the greenhouse because it doesn't have to counter pressure 14 psi, and it also lowers the pressure on the hab gotcha. because the hab is only combating half half an atmosphere, not a full atmosphere. Gotcha. Any other questions? Yes. My question is: saying designing the Atacama Desert is really right. Yeah. I thought about doing it somewhere in the state. It seems to me that there's more demand. People want to go. 
place like this in either the States or Europe, whereas if you did it in Chile, it would be nice, but even there would be a huge cost. Um, the Atacama Desert was the inspiration, and it was actually the Peruvian side of the desert, but because okay. uh, that was, uh, give credit where credit is due, the Peruvian team did the inspire it. Uh, but you could put this anywhere, and like I said, this is, I'll, at some point I would like to just sit down with my drill press and stuff in the, in the garage and start cranking one of these things out for myself. Um, but yeah, this has a lot of market potential. That's part of the reason these blueprints are intentionally vague and we're not getting into the construction because there's a lot of proprietary intellectual property there. So, yes, John? There seems to be sort of three modes of thinking about Mars service habitat. So you get your typical tuna can versus <coughs> ports either on the surface or above the surface. You have one that's on the surface, but it's been protected by a regular mound of regolith or other radiation protection. And then you have the one where they just go ahead and use the excavator to, to bury the habitat in such a way that you continue to add more habitats at the same level in the pit and extend your pit as you go. Uh -huh. So this, it sounds like it would be above ground, right? It can't be, and that actually is its own, because it's making its own, it, because you're putting ice on top, you're essentially making your own underground cab even though it's on the surface. How thick is and, the ice? Hmm? How thick is the ice? Well, three and a half meters. Oh, three now. Okay, well that's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> pretty good cosmic radiation. Yeah, good, pretty good cosmic ray shielding. And besides, it's and does there oh darn, we ran out of water. We'll just does anyone get have out of torch. To, <laughs> to make, make it clear why the ice is so useful compared to rock or metal, because if heavy nuclei hits metal, the secondary particles are going to be heavy nuclei, right? Right. But if it hits water, they're going to be light nuclei. So the yeah. same mass of water is better and the same mass of metal or rock. It's right. you, want, you want the hydrogen concentrations as high as possible, and right. of course it's H2O, right. so there you go. That's the last um, so you have the issue with the oxygen. There is actually another advantage is that if you reinforce ice, it's called picrete, and it's actually stronger than concrete. Um, so if, like I said, if a meteor comes in and you know, you've, you've got a bunker for all practical purposes. The other thing I, is if I scale this to two meters like I did in my previous talk an hour ago, um, the, the raw um, pressurized shell that you would put the water tanks in is only 2,000 kilograms. So you can send a lot of these things to Mars in one narrow shell and then just pop them out and then start putting your crew gear in or if you need to put a layer of them on top with your water supply or whatever, then you can put it up there. Another, another way would be to use basically uh, uh, rubberized bags and once you put the water in them, the water freezes solid, so that it would it, it, the bag would be wouldn't, it wouldn't matter if it leaked. Uh, I've got some ideas there, and, and Olga here has done her master's thesis on so very much that idea. So you'll probably want to talk to her briefly. Yes. Uh, what are the estimated costs for this? Yeah, for a uh, uh, analog base. For an analog base, i that's the next thing I need to do because I need to I'm. This is as far as I got with this. I need to sit down with a, you know, my building codes on one hand and my CAD program on the other and figure out, okay, how much wood, how many bolts and everything. I've got most of the construction techniques done in my head. Um, so I know how to put it together in such a way that you can take it apart because that's kind of important if you're going to move it. Um, that was actually the hardest part. I've been noodling on that for a year um, to get it so where it could be put together and taken apart multiple times. So we so, may have to give us an update to the next Yeah, website. exactly. And actually, I've got even more grand ideas than this next year. OK, I've been told one minute, so I've got any? a comment for you. Yes? I know how busy you are, but for folks like me, you've got a lot of time on our hands. Mm -hmm. There's, and you, maybe you have or not, those are called park models, is what you're talking about, yeah. the less. But um, have you heard of this, the, the craze of the mini, or the tiny, or the micro home? Exactly. OK. Uh, there's three or four experts in the United States on that. Mm -hmm. They know about where everything is, and not you, not just you, but any designer for the Mars stuff, it would behoove them to get in touch with those folks. Has I've anyone been... seen the, the tiny house business? Yeah. It's just incredibly uh, um, imaginative, and they make it come real. It just. And, yeah, there's that, and no there's, also, there's also a furniture guy in yeah. 
Europe who's doing some incredible just looks like transformers that <laughs> I'm saying. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, this is this is popular because we're you know, we're all broke. We need to live in small places. <laughs> what about Mars materials to build them out of? Um, again it's once you have a stu structure that you can use as a workshop, the then you can start cranking out the bricks and put them in the same form. Okay, we're all good. Thank you. Thank you.